Welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone from around the world to today's program. My name is Harvey Feinberg. I'm the president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Previously, I had the privilege of serving as president of a sister academy of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, now called the National Academy of Medicine. I have the responsibility and the pleasure of serving as today's moderator for our program on engineering's role in catalyzing COVID-19 response, recovery, and resilience. This is the third and final in a webinar series on the general subject of engineering for a healthy and resilient future. The series is made possible in part through funding from Fulgen Genetics, for which we are very appreciative. Today, we will hear from three speakers, one from the United Kingdom, one from China, and one from the United States. They will look ahead to engineering and innovation's role in strengthening future public health, healthcare system resilience, and pandemic preparedness. They will speak to the challenges of implementing advances in these areas and the promise that engineering brings for restoring a vibrant economy and society. Following their presentations, we will conduct a moderated roundtable where we will bring in three additional participants who will add their perspectives on how engineers and engineering thinking can be brought to bear to strengthen the response to the next pandemic and public health emergency. I will introduce all in time, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce the head of the host academy for this webinar. Professor Sir Jim McDonald is president of the Royal Academy of Engineering and is principal and vice chancellor of the University of Strathclyde. He also co-chairs the Scottish government's Energy Advisory Board, serves as chairman of the independent Glasgow Economic Leadership Board, and holds other senior appointments in both the private sector and public organizations. In 2012, Professor McDonald was awarded a knighthood for what we might think of as his triple E services to education, to engineering, and to the economy. He's a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and the Institute of Physics and the Energy Institute. Sir Jim will be appearing today via a pre-recorded message. Let's listen. Good afternoon to those in the UK. Good morning to our colleagues in the United States and good evening to those in China. On behalf of the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering, I am delighted to welcome you to this webinar organized jointly by our Academy, the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and the US National Academy of Engineering. This is the third and final webinar in our series exploring engineering's role in catalyzing COVID-19 response, recovery, and resilience. Like so many of the challenges we face today, COVID-19 is a global problem, which no country can tackle alone. We have therefore been delighted to partner with our colleagues in the US and in China. This webinar series allows us to share experiences and expertise across the world and to foster international engineering discussion and collaboration. The first two webinars have looked back at how extraordinary engineering innovations from PPE manufacture to vaccine development and distribution have been essential in our global response to and recovery from the pandemic. However, 
These discussions have also highlighted the challenges and barriers that engineers have faced in developing and implementing coordinated and effective responses in the face of this crisis. 18 months into the pandemic, we can begin to look back at what has worked well and what hasn't, and to learn lessons for our future pandemic preparedness and public health. For example, following the publication of our initial report on infection resilient environments, our academy is continuing to work with policymakers to explore how our built environment can play a key role in our public health, particularly in managing infections. I believe this important theme will come up several times in our event today. We are also building on our pandemic preparedness program to learn lessons for the future. To date, the program has funded 25 research and innovation projects, working in problems from infection control to adaptation of education systems for the new normal. We now plan to conduct a global review of engineering's role in pandemic preparedness, drawing lessons from these research projects and the experiences of the broader engineering and innovation communities during the pandemic. We will also seek to better communicate engineering's offer in tackling global health challenges. Today's webinar similarly looks forward. As we hope now to be moving cautiously towards the end of the pandemic, our speakers today will explore how engineering can contribute to improve public health, more resilient healthcare systems, and better pandemic preparedness for a healthier future. As with the immediate response to the pandemic, this is not a straightforward task. We must continue to share knowledge and expertise with the best engineers and innovators around the world to help us meet these challenges effectively. I hope that this webinar today will give a flavor of the innovative and important work ongoing in this field across our three countries and provide inspiration and opportunities for future collaboration and dialogue. While this is the final webinar in the series, our academies are committed to working together, including through our next Global Grand Challenges Summit to foster collaboration and support the global engineering community in tackling our greatest and most urgent global challenges. Thank you for participation in this webinar and many thanks to Ming Sui and Fulgent Genetics for the sponsorship of this event series. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much, Sir Jim. I might just add a note of appreciation to the leadership and membership of all three co-sponsoring academies. Their collaboration demonstrates the global significance of the challenges that we will be discussing today and that have animated the entire webinar series. Our first speaker today is Edith Blennerhassett. Ms. Blennerhassett is a director with the Built Environment and Engineering Consultancy, Arup, a chartered building services engineer. She has more than 35 years of experience in design and delivery of complex problems, complex projects that meet ambitious goals for technical excellence and sustainability. I suppose it would be more apt to say complex projects that solve complex problems. Ms. Blennerhassett is renowned for her work in social infrastructure projects. And a hallmark of what she does is collaboration as a means for delivering projects that are robust, resilient, easy to implement, and cost-effective to own, operate, and maintain. Most recently, her focus has been on whole life carbon life cycle management and on COVID protection measures. These are challenges for both the immediate and the long term. Her talk today is entitled From Macro to Micro, Engineering Future Ecosystems. 
And now let's hear from Ms. Blenner Hassett. Thank you very much, Dr. Feinberg, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today with my Canterbury colleagues from the US and from China to talk a bit about how engineers can help deliver healthy and resilient futures. Ah, my slides seem to be stuck. It's not a good start. <laughs> Ah, great. In, in the UK, through COVID, it's been acknowledged that the, um, the poorest parts of society were impacted the most. And it's also been recognised that there's a need for huge investment in infrastructure, including health infrastructure. But it's been noted, too, that that investment must create jobs, must help with the levelling up agenda. And in building back better, we must take account of economic, social and environmental aspects. Oh, don't have my slides. Uh, now? Apologies, apologies, everyone. So I was just saying that the investment in infrastructure going forward has to generate both economic, social and environmental benefit. The other key theme in the UK with COP26 coming in Glasgow in the, in the few weeks ahead is to reach net zero. And the UK government has set targets to hit net zero by 2050. And many other organizations have, have joined that agenda. And in particular, the National Health Service in the UK has said it will hit net zero for all its scope emissions for 2045. And so part of moving to net zero is to work uh, to achieve a circular economy, to design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use for as long as possible, and to regenerate natural systems. And all of this is underpinned by our ongoing digital transformation. We've seen through COVID how digital has enabled us to work from home, has enabled telemedicine. Um, we're leveraging data to come up with science-based targets, and indeed we're shopping online. So very much everything we do going forward will have this digital underpinning. So as mentioned, I'm going to speak about engineering inter interventions from a large scale to a small scale. And at a global level, many countries and organizations have signed up to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And these very much look at protecting human health and well-being as well as planetary health and well-being. At a city level, as I mentioned again, the levelling up agenda is key and putting people at the heart of our cities. At a building level, the focus is on net zero and indeed COVID resilience. And at a macro level, there's a focus on air quality, both in our cities and in our buildings. I'll very briefly look back um, and, and note a few of the, the things that happened through COVID from an engineering perspective, and then I'll, I'll look forward. Um, I think at a global and national level, most governments produced guidance in relation to COVID. And this just shows one document produced by the UK government for office spaces and working safely in offices. And it contains recommendations about a wide ranging things, including working from home, um, hygiene, maintenance, ventilation, and so on, and social distancing. At a city level, many of our hospitals struggled to uh, deliver the beds they needed to care for all the, all the patients. And so many engineers were involved in the UK in what were called Nightingale hospitals. And we developed a series of patterns for adding capacity to hospitals from a, a modular rapid build prefabricated unit that could be put adjacent to existing hospitals to um, looking at ancillary buildings such as multi-storey car parks that might be attached to hospitals to see how they could be repurposed to provide additional beds. And then looking at step down facilities in the communities, converting exhibition centres or school halls or gymnasiums into, um, into beds. And also there was a low resource version done for deployment in, in remote or underprivileged areas. At a, again, a city and building level, we've converted um, software that was used to look at perhaps queuing and, and people movement in airports and train stations to look at how emergency departments and hospitals could be reconfigured to deliver services but provide social distancing. And again, this software was used in offices to look at implementation of one-way systems and how to maximize occupancy whilst maintaining social distancing. And again, this just shows the power of digital in terms of um, 
what digital can bring us using machine learning, using artificial intelligence to help our decision making. At a building level, there's been a huge focus on ventilation going right back to the start of the pandemic. And the, the focus has been changing as time has gone by and as we've learned more. And Professor Noakes gave a very interesting talk on ventilation um, investigations at the previous webinar. But again, the focus has been on increasing air quality, um, increasing air change rates, using air filtration and air scrubbers to remove pathogens and aerosol that might be infected with COVID from the air and uh, to look at things like humidity control, which would be unusual in the UK. And then types of ventilation systems are being looked at as well. And the left-hand diagram shows a displacement ventilation system where fresh air is put in beneath the floor, rises up through the occupied zone, takes the uh, pollutants that are generated by people in the occupied zone and then extract it at high level. On the right-hand side, uh, there's a diagram that shows openable windows. And again, there's been a focus on, can we open the windows in our buildings? And what does that mean? Can we, if we do that, can we provide enough heating or cooling for the air? And what's the balance between energy use and ventilation? And in engineering, there are often these balances that have to be achieved to get the optimum answer. And this diagram also shows a, a traditional fan coil unit where air would be recirculated and heated and cooled. And again, these systems have been looked at to look at the trajectory of the ventilation and, and at the filtration. At a micro level, we were involved with a multidisciplinary team, including um, NHS surgeons led by Dr. Ian Renfrew, uh, Rolls-Royce and the MTC in the optimization of an aerosol generating procedure shield. This shield is used when people are being intubated and extubated, basically put on ventilators and um, the shield was optimized so that uh, the maximum amount of particles would be extracted as people cough when they're being extubated. So the CFD, computational fluid dynamic analysis, was used to optimize the shield and the position and size of the extract. So now looking forward, where, where do we go? Where do we go from here? We hope we're out of the worst of COVID, but there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And in particular, at a, at a global level, it's very much been recognized that uh, the climate crisis is a healthcare crisis. Uh, pollution is a, a huge contributing factor to respiratory diseases and, and many cancers. And, um, and also um, extreme weather events caused by climate change, such as wildfire, wildfires, floods and storms, are, are putting um, a lot of weight into the healthcare system. And then the healthcare system in itself generates um, climate emissions. Uh, the UK and indeed globally, the uh, healthcare system represents over 4% of, of um, global, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So healthcare has very much uh, taken a stand to say they would lead on climate uh, change by mitigation, by decarbonizing, delivering resilient infrastructure and improving health equity. At a city level, through COVID, many of us were locked down and a focus came on what was called the 15 minute neighborhood, uh, whether we could get all we need within 15 minutes, can we cycle, can we walk, can we have outdoor space to exercise and, and meet in a safe way. But I'm not going to dwell on this because Professor Wang, who will be speaking next, this is very much her area of expertise. At a building level, as I mentioned, the focus has been on getting to net zero for 2050 with many steps in between. And to date, we've had a lot of legislation and focus on operational carbon. Uh, but the question is, what is net zero? And net zero is being defined as looking at both embodied and operational carbon. The embodied carbon can represent between 30 and 70% of the carbon emissions of a building through its life cycle. So from an operational perspective, the focus is on uh, driving down the need for energy, driving down heating and cooling need with the design of the building, uh, having very good daylight, which is good for well-being, but also reduces the, um, the use of um, artificial lighting and electricity consumption in association, having very efficient systems to deliver the energy needs of the building and having good control on those systems, and then meeting the energy demands with a combination of on-site renewables and, and as the, the grid decarbonizes, meeting more and more from decarbonized electricity. On the embodied carbon front, 80% of the buildings that we'll have in 2050 have already been built. So there's a new focus on looking at our existing buildings. How can we transform and reuse them? How can we build less? How can we um, optimize our materials and use lower carbon materials? And all of these things also help to uh, deal with some of the health, the health associated issues. At a micro level, 
we're using again CFD analysis to look at ventilation in spaces and say are, are spaces stagnant and if they are there's a chance that COVID or other viruses could build up in the air and infect people within the spaces and so looking at ventilation and, and how to optimize ventilation and looking at other technologies such as ultraviolet germicidal irradiation both in, in air handling systems and, and through lighting to sterilize, sterilize the air outside the occupied zone. So I hope that gives you a very brief overview of, of all the different types of interventions that could happen from global to from global to a, a micro scale. As engineers, we very much have the power to transform the built environment for the better, tackling climate change and at the same time providing more healthy and resilient futures. There are great challenges for us as engineers at the moment, but there are also great opportunities. So it's a great time to be an engineer. And with that, I'll stop and hand over for the next speaker. Thank you. Well, Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Blennerhasset. Uh, that was a comprehensive, informative, and exciting overview of the role of engineering at so many levels. I know we'll want to come back in the discussion period to probe a little more deeply into some of the critical points that you raised. Our next speaker today is Professor Lan Wang. Professor Wang is the founder and head of the Healthy City Lab and Deputy Dean of the College of Architecture and Urban Planning at Tanji University. She also serves as Deputy Director and Secretary General of the China Healthy City Committee, Executive Director of the Asian Development Bank Tanji Urban Knowledge Hub. Professor Wang's research focuses on healthy city planning and design, urban development strategy and planning, methodology and technology to inform better urban planning. Today, her talk is entitled Toward Healthy Cities, Research and Practice. And now let's hear from Professor Wang. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. Uh, I will share my screen right now. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to share my research and practice uh, toward healthy cities. Uh, as an urban planner and uh, designer, I may share you some uh, idea and uh, uh, research outcome at a, a little bit micro level. So as we all know, um, health is a state of uh, complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And uh, it's very important to know that uh, uh, the uh, age uh, constitutional factors will interact with different layers of the uh, space and then shape the uh, well-being and health of ourselves. And just because of that, uh, the WHO is high uh, lighting that uh, the function of urban planning and also trying to use different uh, uh, solutions and planning tools to develop a healthy city. As you can see, uh, this concept has been proposed by WHO in uh, 1984 and gave a very detailed uh, definition in 1994. And just based on that, uh, we're thinking right now, especially uh, during and uh, COVID-19, we are hoping our urban space uh, should focusing on its uh, healthiness, uh, which will uh, highlight in the cumulative effects of the urban system on human well-being. And also we are hoping that uh, the urban space will be a very important uh, uh, focal point to um, prepare uh, how we could deal with the uh, pandemic, the healthy public health emergency. So I think there will should be a value shift be, um, from the urban space as a product of economic development uh, to how we could use urban space to promote uh, health. This is uh, the starting point of our uh, Healthy City Lab. So what we are doing right now is hoping to integrate uh, uh, research uh, practice 
and also to develop certain uh, policy tools such as uh, HIA health impact assessment tools to help the decision makers and uh, planners to understand our space, our proposal has uh, its really important uh, function to uh, with the health promotion. So um, based on that, um, we are hoping to show you, uh, to develop certain uh, theoretical framework, um, either uh, deal with the uh, chronic non-communicable disease and also the infectious disease. So you can see on the one side is urban space and on the other side is the two types of the health outcomes. And for each of those uh, types of the uh, disease, the urban space has certain um, function either to promote active lifestyle or we could provide the spatial prevention and the intervention. And this is the two uh, lines, two uh, ways of the framework uh, we are developing right now. Um, and for the chronic non-communicable disease, uh, this is the theoretical framework uh, I developed and it has been adopted by uh, WHO and UN Habitat in uh, their uh, source book announced in 2020. Um, in, in this framework, I highlighted that what kind of spatial factors will have the impact on the health and the health equity. And there are three approaches. Uh, one is trying to decrease the, the uh, sources of pollution and its human exposure. And then the uh, third one is we could provide the uh, accessible uh, nearby facilities and amenities. And the third one is at a higher level, trying to promote physical activity and social interaction. And based on that, um, our lab is trying to uh, conduct the empirical study uh, on those three pathways, the three, three approaches. The first one is trying to figure out uh, uh, the health risks at the micro level. So, and this is why uh, my lab developed a, a very large database for the healthy city uh, like Shanghai and uh, also um, um, Luoyang, Hangzhou uh, and other like 260 uh, Chinese cities. And we combined the health outcome uh, data together with the physical built environment data and trying to build the model to uh, see what kind of uh, health, um, what kind of physical built environment factors significantly uh, will impact uh, the health outcome. For instance, right, uh, this one I, I'm showing you is related to the uh, lung cancer incidence and we figure out the, the mixed land use and the uh, dense loads may have certain impact on the uh, lung cancer incidence. Um, I, and then the, the second way is trying to assess the distribution of the community facilities, such as the facilities for elderly. Uh, this one is um, we based on the data from Shanghai um, and uh, we figure out the different types of the um, facilities for elders, elderly. And then we use certain um, way to calculate uh, their distribution in, in terms of the uh, health uh, equity. And we use uh, like a Lawrence curve and, and Gini coefficient to show where we should add more uh, facilities for the elderly. And we have also conducted a similar um, calculation and evaluation for community um, uh, exercise uh, facilities and uh, and playground, something like that. This is the second uh, pathway. Um, the third way is um, trying to promote physical activity. So we, what we are doing in uh, the empirical study is trying to figure out how we could design a park uh, to promote the diversity of physical activities. So this is some uh, modeling we developed based on the data in Shanghai. Um, and we conducted the observational data connection in the parks. And uh, we also put uh, different uh, variables related to the site design and also the vegetation design and uh, to figure out uh, the significant factors impact the, the human activity. And then also we're trying to figure out on the street uh, what we can do, uh, what kind of 
uh, maybe engineering design or the, the site design, we could promote uh, uh, workability and also cycling. This is some sort of the um, uh, empirical research and, and uh, assessment tool we developed in the GIS. And then all those three uh, pathways are more focusing on the chronic um, non-communicable disease. So what's the relationship this with the uh, pandemic? It is actually uh, focusing on how we could decrease the vulnerable population as I show it here, because this is one of the three um, very important components to decrease the infectious disease and for its prevention. And also uh, in these um, types of the disease, not only we hoping to promote uh, to promote health, uh, to decrease the vulnerable population, we also conducted research to uh, decrease the transmission. Uh, this is the so sort of the uh, theoretical framework for the infectious disease to figure out the infection process, both eco ecological process and the social process and uh, how it will impact in uh, the micro and the uh, um, macro uh, environment. And based on this, um, we conducted uh, also uh, some of the empirical studies to figure out the significant factors and also trying to identify the important facilities. Uh, for instance, this, this one is uh, we connect the data um, uh, from the beginning and to uh, March uh, 23rd, uh, 2020, um, because we have uh, like 288 cluster transmission cases. And uh, we figure out uh, which uh, kind of uh, facilities uh, actually has the um, the, the, the biggest uh, transmission uh, rate. And then you can come back to see which kind of facilities you should pay most attention. And then we also conducted a certain uh, research based on data in the United States. Uh, this one is at the county level. We um, put the like uh, 643 counties into uh, this modeling. Um, and we uh, divided the variables uh, to show the vulnerable population uh, intervention in transmission pathways and also how we could pro provide the uh, healthcare resources. And uh, in uh, this model, we figure out uh, um, six uh, new factors which are significantly associated with the COVID-19 incidents. And you can uh, take a look and uh, for our uh, urban planner and designers, or maybe engineering, um, the housing is quite important. We find out that, that the household with severe housing problems actually will uh, increase the uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. Um, and also uh, you can see some related to the home-based working and it give us the clue uh, in the future how we could um, design the healthy community and cities. And then based on all those uh, empirical study, we proposed that uh, uh, what just uh, uh, Edith mentioned about the uh, 15 minutes uh, community life circle. This is way we are calling it uh, in China, maybe you call it a 15 minute city, but basically uh, we are hoping that within the five minutes walking distance, uh, we could access to medical support and uh, services for elderly. And we can also uh, conduct uh, physical activities within five minutes. So this um, more for the daily health. And at the same time, we are hoping within these five minutes uh, community life circle, we can provide um, emergency uh, facilities and also uh, its support. So this is sort of the idea. Uh, right now it has many uh, practice in China so uh, just now I'm um, actually show you the two uh, types of the disease in terms of uh, its uh, theoretical framework um, and empirical study as urban planner or designer, uh, what we can do. And then I will quickly show you uh, a case, uh, which is a, a micro, I call it a healthy oriented micro regeneration. Um, it's, uh, a case in Shanghai, and it has been selected as the best practice of healthy design um, 
um, by the World Bank, and uh, it also a case uh, for the UN habitat. So it's a it looks like that. It's a, an elderly, um, you know, is an aging community, and uh, um, it's located um, in the no northeast of Shanghai and with a sort of uh, a little bit dilapidated uh, facilities, and uh, it has. Um, primary school and kindergarten on um, um, both sides. And this is why this garden become very com important for them. So we conducted a survey on healthy needs and also trace their, um, their, uh, uh, their uh, daily activity, how they use this park and what they really need. And then we conducted the uh, analysis for the health elements, in, especially in terms of its quality. And then we conducted a simulation in terms of uh, wind to identify where we should uh, uh, pay attention, especially during the cold winter. And also we conducted a sunlight simulation to figure out uh, if the sunlight is enough, especially um, during the day and at a specific time when kids um, come out of the school and where uh, the kids, got, uh, kids from the kindergarten, uh, they, they would select. And this is the way we actually um, to um, have this site design. And this is sort of the, uh, the multiple uh, functional um, sections we, uh, we are allocated in the site and ho hoping to promote health for all. And also at the same time, as I mentioned, health impact assessment is a very important tool. So we also conducted this for this site design. And you can see not only we uh, promoted uh, physical activity and uh, we also consider uh, this place as an alternative care place and uh, during the pandemic. All right, this is basically, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation after the uh, construction, but we still need to add more uh, for sure, uh, especially some sensors uh, to tell us the, um, the air quality and uh, uh, hoping that we could make it like a, a more smart health uh, site. All right, um, so that's what we are doing um, at the lab, uh, Healthy City Lab, and also, you know, uh, how uh, that's, that's our way toward healthy cities on um, the theoretical and em empirical research. And we are hoping it could provide evidence to support our practice in urban planning and design. And lastly, we are hoping to uh, find out the better institutional design in terms of its uh, health governance and uh, um, develop more uh, healthy impact assessment tools to promote um, health in all types of uh, planning, uh, design, and the projects. Thank you all. I would end my presentation um, to cite the, uh, the, the sentences listed at, uh, in the source book by WHO and the UN Habitat. Uh, if the purpose of planning is not for human and planetary health, then what is it for? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wang. That was a very inspiring and stimulating overview. In a way, you have articulated a new synthetic field of geospatial epidemiology. And I hope we can come back to learn more of how you are incorporating these ideas also in your educational programs at the university. Perhaps we have time in the discussion to return uh, to that, as well as many other fascinating aspects of your presentation. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Professor Roderick Pettigrew. Professor Pettigrew is the Chief Executive Officer of Engineering Health and Executive Dean for Engineering Medicine at Texas A&M University. He also holds the endowed Robert A. Welch Chair in Medicine at the university. Professor Pettigrew is widely renowned in the United States as the founding director for the National Institute 
of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at the US National Institutes of Health. Among his many recognitions and honors, Professor Pettigrew has been elected to membership in the US National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His remarks today will speak to the convergence between engineering and medicine in preparing and responding to future pandemics. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome now my dear friend, Professor Rod Pettigrew. Thank you, uh, Harvey. And uh, good morning, US. Good afternoon, UK. And good evening, China. Um, as Dr. Feinberg indicated, I will focus on this theme of the convergence and what I would call convergence engineering and helping us to prepare for future crises. I start with a commentary that was published by the National Academy of Medicine 15 months ago when we were deep into the first wave of the pandemic. And in this uh, commentary, I issued a call for a deeper integration of science, clinicians, and engineers to help meet these challenges through a convergence, uh, as uh, Dr. Feinberg indicated, of at least medicine, sociology, and engineering, and through this convergence, develop practical solutions to the challenges that we have faced, are facing, and are likely to face in the future. This I conveniently refer to as convergence engineering. And from this approach, I think we can anticipate, and expect, and even work towards innovations that would be designed specifically to increase accessibility, to have ease of use, and to address some of the social challenges that have been starkly illuminated by uh, COVID-19. In doing this in a way that reaches across the globe and addresses the issues that have emerged for everyone on this planet, we should also then be able to develop approaches which would redress some of the socially based inequalities uh, that this pandemic has uh, illuminated. Quite recently, as indicated here, the White House, through its Office of Science and Technology Policy, has issued a rather uh, issued a rather comprehensive report on pandemic preparedness, uh, identifying a series of goals that would prepare us to do a better job in addressing uh, the next uh, pandemic that we are likely to face. Uh, in the area of transforming medical defenses, the goal of developing vaccines against any virus uh, called a pan vaccine or a universal vaccine and having this developed rapidly in 100 days after such a virus would emerge. Uh, complementary therapeutics developed even before the pandemic are certainly being created rapidly as a goal. And diagnostics uh, at large scale develop so that they are inexpensive and uh, achieved in weeks post a threat and having those distributed within weeks uh, post the emergence of a threat. Uh, those are specific goals where engineering would play a key role in meeting these. And then developing early warning, real-time monitoring systems uh, to detect viruses, monitor the, the spread of, of, of the viruses, expand our capabilities to respond to emergencies through strengthening our public health systems, 
Uh, this was touched upon beautifully by Dr. Wang in her presentation. Uh, modernizing our approaches, utilizing a digital infrastructure, uh, as was indicated by Dr. Uh, Benner Hassett, uh, and in so doing, prioritizing the vulnerable communities, also mentioned by Dr. Wang, uh, improving our core capabilities, uh, developing uh, and having readily available the types of uh, systems and devices that we uh, relied on in this uh, particular uh, pandemic, uh, including sanitizing the built environment, uh, as we heard from our first speaker. Uh, and in so doing, uh, having greater involvement and inclusion of the regulatory system in our strategies and our planning uh, as we engineer these uh, solutions. And then finally, changing our approach so that we actually manage uh, this mission in a way that is analogous to what was done to place a man on the moon and return uh, those individuals safely to Earth through the Apollo program and doing this in conjunction with the international science community. And by here uh, and here, they actually mean having uh, the focus, uh, the governance, the oversight, uh, the stepwise planning, uh, and the responsibility, the accountability, are uh, all being managed in such a way that there is attention being paid specifically in this cohesive and systematic uh, approach to get us through a pandemic uh, that will come in the future. And in addition to those goals articulated by the White House, I would submit additional goals. We need to focus uh, on our communication with a plan and a strategy that would minimize misinformation, which has emerged uh, as a, a challenge in the current pandemic. Specifically addressing the underserved communities and keeping this front of mind and at the forefront of our designs and uh, engineers can help with this. And finally, I would submit uh, that engineers are a part of uh, this process. And so engineers need to be uh, included in the holistic response team of first responders uh, so that we have a systems approach to manage managing challenges in the future, uh, leading to an enhanced pre-crisis coordination of engineering and clinical medicine in order to, to do this. Now, we are well aware of these compounding crises uh, that we are living with now and working through uh, the the first three is shown there, in fact, the fourth, if we include the climate crisis. But while those have been challenging, those have also been instructive and pointed to the critical role that engineering plays. Here in uh, this review article, two years before uh, COVID uh, became a problem and a reality, you see the identification of the role that engineering played in the development of what was then a new era in vaccinology, mRNA vaccines, which have become uh, critical to us getting through and out of this pandemic. And this recent uh, timeline review of the work that was done over the last couple of decades to deliver to the world these multiple highly effective vaccines, we see that there are multiple people involved in working in multiple areas, uh, multiple disciplines that were all brought together to realize this virus, and also in multiple sites and location, uh, from uh, the US to the UK, uh, to uh, information from China, over these couple of decades, pointing to the value of a team effort, in fact, the importance and the need of having a team effort in order to 
address a challenging problem like this. This underscores our need to have this convergence, a team approach going forward. On the horizon, we uh, see promises for advancing additional technologies that will help us. Already, we've seen the convergence of artificial intelligence and the ubiquitous data available now passively from smartwatches that many people wear. Uh, the, uh, co this uh, convergence has demonstrated that utilizing this data, analyzing it, one can actually predict the presence of an infection days before an individual is aware that he or she actually is infected. And that's based on largely heart and respiratory data. But additional and advanced data is likely to come from watches. This from my own institute, my colleague Ruth Bay Jafar, developing a smart watch that's able to image deep into the risk uh, identify a pulse wave from an artery and from that extract parameters that are uh, indicative of the blood pressure, both diastolic and systolic shown here with great accuracy. Also in the area of point of care devices and technologies, uh, the institute that I formerly was uh, uh, the director of, uh, Dr. Weinberg, uh, Feinberg mentioned uh, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, now in the leadership of Bruce Tromberg, played a monumental role in helping the U.S. rapidly accelerate its availability of diagnostic tests, uh, including tests that are uh, usable at the point of care, in fact, in the home, using this uh, biosensor technology uh, called quantum dots and available in the drugstore, and this is a common drugstore uh, in the U.S. On the horizon, uh, we see additional uh, data and, and, and uh, analysis of that data being useful through this convergence approach. approach. Having uh, the ability to monitor the symptoms early on and from that extract the likelihood that an individual is going to, to need respiratory support, for example, as reported uh, in this first article. And using digital tracing devices to, to not only uh, execute tracing, but get feedback and indicators as to how well an individual is doing, whether or not that person needs uh, food support, medication support, and in so doing, uh, address this issue of a more equitable uh, delivery of health and health care. And uh, also, uh, the advent is being shown here of, uh, of approaches that promise to, in fact, help deliver on this idea of having a universal vaccine. Early work showing uh, vaccines uh, that are specific to to, to more than one site in targeting uh, the target uh, uh, on the uh, COVID uh, particle. Here, so-called bispecific antibodies that target multiple regions, not just a single region on the spike protein, making it uh, more applicable to, uh, to various uh, variants. And the advent of complementary technologies, nanotechnologies that are able to uh, mitigate uh, the uh, expression of these viruses and in fact uh, cover those viruses as shown here so that they are not as infectious uh, as they uh, uh, would be if they were not uh, covered in this way. And additional technologies that would uh, actually destroy the virus particle before even getting to the point of stimulating an immune response. And then finally, here the idea of having a system that would allow us to vaccinate ourselves at, at home. Uh, this technology having been developed uh, over the last decade, still uh, in, in progress and in process, uh, this uh, vaccine patch developed by Mark uh, Prosnitz undergoing uh, evaluation even as we speak. So in conclusion, 
there are a number of uh, advances that have been made and challenges before us, but our pathway uh, to being ready for the next pandemic involves convergence of engineering medicine and sociology so that we're able to have the pan vaccines that have been uh, hypothesized and, and our goals, these types of novel uh, therapeutics that will mitigate uh, uh, the uh, deleterious effects of viruses, uh, in addition to stimulating the immune system, having systems that are rapid in their response, early warning systems, a, a greater focus on vulnerable communities through using digital means to modernize our public health systems and strengthening those, uh, a particular focus on communication and a strategy that uses science to minimize uh, misinformation. And the final uh, uh, statement I'd like to make is to view engineers as part of the holistic response team and in so doing establish a coordinated uh, pre-crisis efforts effort that involves a convergence of team members coming from the engineering, science, and the clinical medicine communities. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Pettigrew. Uh, this was uh, a wide ranging and a very exciting set of insights into the manifold ways that engineering expertise can be brought to bear on emergent and long lasting problems uh, like the pandemic that the world continues to experience. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity now uh, with uh, our three speakers and three additional experts to engage in a roundtable discussion. Let me just take a moment to introduce uh, the three who are joining us, and then uh, we'll begin the uh, roundtable conversation. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Amy Pickering. Uh, the Bloom Center Distinguished Chair in Global Poverty and Practice, jointly appointed in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Bloom Center for Developing Economies at the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to Berkeley, uh, Professor Pickering held positions at Tufts University, Stanford University, the US Environmental Protection Agency, and she served as a Fulbright Fellow uh, in Malaysia. Her research combines tools from multiple disciplines, engineering to be sure, also economics, microbiology, epidemiology, and others to examine and develop low cost, scalable interventions that can interrupt disease transmission in low income countries. I know we'll all look forward to hearing from Professor Pickering uh, in this discussion. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Professor Chun Zhang. She is the Vice Chair of the Department of Urban Planning in the School of Architecture and Design at Beijing Jiaotong University. She is also Vice Secretary of the China Regional Science Association and a board member of the Beijing Institution of Engineers. Her research interests focus on synergistic relationships across transit, urban form, and work-life balance. Since the COVID pandemic, uh, she has focused her research on sustainable and resilient transportation systems, emphasizing the role of reliable public transit during a period of lockdown. And that will be something I hope we can hear from and I know will relate to many of our other discussions on sustainable urban design. And finally, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor John Clarkson, Professor of Engineering Design at the University of Cambridge and Professor of Healthcare Systems at Delft University of Technology. He's also director of the Cambridge Engineering Design Center and co-director of Cambridge Public Health. 
His research focuses on healthcare design, inclusive design, process management, change management, and automotive design. He's the author of more than 800 papers, a number of books uh, covering topics such as medical equipment design, inclusive design and process management, and he's an elected member, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. It's uh, really a treat to have all of you with us, uh, and I look forward to comments from all. I would, to begin, like to return uh, for a moment to our first uh, presentation and discussant, uh, Ms. Blennerhassett, uh, Edith, if I may, uh, your uh, work spans what is arguably the greatest long-term existential threat to the planet, uh, namely climate and carbon, and what is arguably the most acute near-term threat, which is the COVID pandemic. So you've somehow managed to land on two of the most pressing and enduring and challenging problems. My question to you is, do you see these as connected but separate in terms of the solutions that need to be designed? Or do you think of synergistic or joint solutions that simultaneously strengthen the Earth's resilience for carbon and help the species contend more successfully with the coronavirus. Could you comment? I, thank you. I, I would say that the two are uh, highly interlinked. I think we've learned a huge amount on our journey through COVID. It's a global pandemic and uh, people, whether it be government, communities, individuals, everybody pulled together to come up with solutions and, and the, the speed at which the solutions were developed has been phenomenal. The speed at which vaccines test and trace, um, all of these things show you know, our capability when, when, we, when we work together in a multidisciplinary way. And, and really the climate threat seems less, less present to people um, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but it's a very similar, a very similar threat in, or maybe over a longer term. And so I think we've seen um, how resilient people are, as I say, how we can come together. And I think that shows us the way forward with climate change, that we need to involve all aspects of, of society from regulation down to, down to community groups and individuals taking taking responsibility and taking action to you know to to find the best solutions to move forward and those solutions can be different in different places as well depending on 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 how they manifest themselves in different countries and different geographies and different climates we may come back i hope to that uh, very subject as well where as well as what needs to be done but for the moment i'd like to turn uh, second uh, to Professor Wong, if I may. Uh, I was so struck in thinking of your presentation in the history of urban design, how so many innovations have generally occurred at new communities, newly designed, newly established, newly built, separate communities. You illustrated part of the example with a community within the limits of the city of Shanghai. I wonder if you could comment <laughs> in terms of the practicality of gaining buy-in and implementation of the design ideas that you advance on the difference between working in a new city or novel design as compared to trying to redesign, rework a long-standing urban center. Could you comment on the challenge in both cases? Thank you. I think um, it's a really good question um, in terms of uh, its comparison, uh, because uh, it has been a long time, um, China has I think also around the world for the developing countries where 
uh, trying to figure out we should have urban regeneration and at the same time we have new town development. So in the new uh, communities, if we design those, uh, it seems that uh, we, we have more free, sort of freedom uh, to do uh, what uh, we're trying to uh, uh, establish. But actually um, it's even more challenging, I think, um, for urban design in the existing uh, cities, because uh, if we cannot really respect the, the, the nature, the surrounding area, the ecosystem um, for the existing uh, site, then, and also how to connect uh, this new community with the existing ones, uh, it may turn out uh, to be a, a master planned community or new town, but may not selected by the residents, uh, which means that uh, for the new developed communities, uh, urban planners and de designers may uh, have to uh, study more how we could really build uh, this brand new uh, cities and uh, towns and communities to attract uh, the population to uh, live, live inside. Um, and uh, I think the, the major challenge is how we could identify the appropriate uh, uh, density, um, development scale, and uh, um, future characteristics, all those things for the, for the new area, which will fit in and which will really also respect the, the existing situation. Um, and then for the urban regeneration, uh, the major challenge is uh, how we could, as you already mentioned, uh, conduct the design within the limited uh, spatial uh, uh, resources. And, and especially in the in Shanghai and the, especially in the mega cities, uh, the population density is pretty high. And also we are getting into the Asian society. So um, it's the, the major challenge uh, is trying to balance the, 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 health, the healthy promotion. And also we try to still hoping the space can promote the economic development. So th this sort of the uh, major challenge in the existing uh, communities. Uh, and uh, also we need to find out who could really finance to uh, support the implementation. And then it will bring the question to urban planners and designers, if we could have a better solution without a very high cost and then improve the uh, the existing situations for for all population for different kinds of groups. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Wang. It's a very uh, fascinating challenge to combine all of the various goals into an integrated plan, as you described. And perhaps sometimes there can be such a thing as uh, too many degrees of freedom too many different options on the blank slate of the brand new city that makes it harder to come to resolution on particular questions. So that was uh, fascinating. Perhaps we can come back to some other examples as well. But I would like uh, for the moment uh, to turn to Professor Pettigrew. Uh, Rod, you've spent your career straddling two worlds, the world of medicine, the world of engineering. You've done it with great aplomb. You have seemed to keep your balance throughout. And as you described in your remarks, looking at engineering medicine and you added sociology, success is going to depend on being able to work in concert, in harmony across fields. <clears throat> My question to you from your experience, do you think it is harder to get the physicians to think like and understand engineering, or is it harder to get the engineers to appreciate and incorporate the principles of medicine and health? What has been the greater challenge for you? <clears throat> An interesting uh, question, Harvey, and Actually, the first time I've been asked that question uh, in, in all of these years. 
Uh, I would say it's uh, not surprisingly equally challenging in both directions, but also equally stimulating. I think I've found that those that are skilled in each of those dis disciplines uh, are excited about what the other discipline can bring to the table and help us all in this common goal that we all have, which is, is health and well-being and, uh, and an enjoyable and long health span. And so the health span and increasing the health span is a concern of engineers Increasing the health span is a concern of physicians. So that is common ground. And I think there is an increased utilization that reaching that common goal is best achieved through a collaboration. And in fact, an integration of the skills and understanding that both groups have. Well, thank you. Uh I think the challenge is real as you're describing, uh, and I can't imagine anyone better positioned to continue building those bridges than you and your person, but maybe we can come back to that in other settings as well. We can speaking come back. Of, thank you. Uh, speaking of settings, most of the examples that we have talked about so far uh, have naturally uh, been based in the uh, UK or China or the US and illustrations of what's uh, been done. But I really wanted now to turn uh, to Professor Pickering, who uh, has developed a special interest and experience in working in lower income countries to improve their ability to effectively intervene and interrupt disease transmission. I really have a two-part question, uh, if I may, uh, Professor Pickering, uh, beyond uh, a few general remarks, which we would all love to hear of your experience in uh, COVID uh, aspects in, in other settings. Uh, but my two questions are, what, if anything, apart from financial resources, sets apart the challenge in lower income countries compared to higher income uh, countries? Is it simply money or is there more? So that's the first question. The second one is a little more uh, about lessons and learning. Traditionally, many people think, well, you take the lessons in the industrialized, sophisticated, more advanced technological countries, and you convey them to countries which have lower capacity to invest in the technologies, education and learning, so that the movement of lessons is effectively, let's just summarize, north-south. And there are other lessons that may be moved south-south. But my question to you, based on your experience in other settings, what, if any, lessons do you take away that would be of relevance and interest to countries like the UK and the US and China from those poorer settings in the world? So I guess I'm asking you to share a little bit of your experience to reflect with us on what are the barriers apart from money per se in lower income countries? And what, if any, lessons would you characterize come from those settings that apply more generally and particularly to uh, wealthier countries? So, uh, Professor Pickering, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. And it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, it's great, great two questions. Um, I guess I'll just start out saying that I think that what this pandemic has shown us is that we have a lot of similar challenges in high-income countries that we've faced in low-income countries, 
diagnostics, getting testing up to at scale has been a problem um, across the entire world. Uh, and caseloads in low resource settings haven't necessarily been higher than they've been in high income countries. So I think this has shown us that um, you know, we have a lot of issues that we need to sort out in high income countries in terms of preparing for the next pandemic, um, as well as in, in low resource settings. Um, I think that, uh, you know, apart from financial resources, some of the challenges in uh, resource constrained settings is just having um, uh, high functioning institutions to be able to implement technologies and strategies to protect human health. Um, and I just want to put in a plug, I think, for critically thinking about how we're training the next generation of engineers. Um, so, you know, technologies don't solve problems on, the, on their own. You have to think about how, if they will actually be used, if they will lead to the benefits that they're designed to provide, or if they will have unintended consequences, and if they're going to be equitable access to them and who will pay for them. So, Excellent example here is vaccine access and, and um, equity across the world in terms of who has access to vaccines. Vaccine access in low resource settings affects transmission of the virus to high income settings in this global economy. Um, and so I would argue that there's a strong need for academic programs that can provide interdisciplinary training to engineers. So I, I would say we need T-shaped engineers to solve these complex global health problems around the world that have depth of expertise in the engineering field, such as mechanical or, or chemical engineering, but also have broader experience in other disciplines, such as epidemiology, global health, product design, economics, complex systems, and ethics. And so here at, the, at Berkeley, at the Blum Center for Developing Economies, um, we have an interdisciplinary program in development engineering where we're focused on training these T-shaped engineers to co-create technologies with community partners um, that meet the needs of individuals living in low resource settings. Um, so in terms of, I think, lessons, lessons learned, uh, going to your, to your second question, um, I see engineers having an important role to play um, in kind of two areas that I, I think um, are important for low and high income settings, which is uh, surveillance systems. So understanding how we're going to be able to predict and prepare for the next pandemic, I think is really going to depend on um, getting good surveillance systems into place. And um, I think that, you know, here we've seen during this pandemic amazing advances in human diagnostics. And so I'm hoping that bioengineers are going to continue to build on innovation that has happened during this pandemic to develop diagnostic tests that don't require expensive capital equipment, which is so important in low resource settings, such as these paper based rapid antigen testing or CRISPR based diagnostics. These types of tests are especially needed for settings that can't afford high cost capital equipment or have reliable electricity to support high put robot high throughput robotics. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that area um, as, as, a, as an area that can can help pre prepare us for the next pandemic. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Pickering. Your comments on the importance of infrastructure across society, the role of training the next generation of engineers, and the idea of developing workable, applicable, equitable technology to solve the problems. Maybe that T-shaped engineer stands for technology uh, in, uh, in a broad sense. Uh, and maybe we'll have a chance to come back uh, also to that. Uh, I would, uh, if I could now, uh, turn to Professor Zhang. You know, when, uh, when uh, Edith Wetterhasset was speaking about the multiple layers of thinking in engineering, from the macro to the micro, I couldn't help but think from a transportation point of view about the levels from global or international transportation to national transportation systems, to urban transportation systems, to personal transportation systems. In a way, we've talked almost more about the walking and biking uh, for the individual 
than we have yet focused on any of the other levels. And certainly urban transportation has been a critical consideration in coping with the pandemic and thinking about future strategies. I wonder from your perspective, if you could offer some comments particularly on the role of transportation, both as a risk factor for communicable disease and as a strategy to enable coping with control of infectious disease like the COVID pandemic. Okay, six for questions. Uh, I'm also very honored to participate in this uh, discussion. Uh, so from the point of uh, transportation planning, actually COVID-19 is not only a disaster, but also an opportunity to reshaping the uh, urban transit system on the metropolitan level and uh, mega, even mega region level. Um, for example, uh, just now, uh, the um, three distinguished speakers mentioned from different scales. On the city scale, uh, we talk about the link between the uh, different parts. Uh, it may have uh, a lot of uh, transportation issue with uh, mobility and also job accessibility, particularly in the uh, less developed country. Uh, when they have no job, they have no food. So when considering uh, that 100% of safety, we also have to link job and housing together. Uh, so on one part of the site, uh, we can build a resilient city by reinforce a very safe and reliable public transit system. Well, the public transit system may not only the uh, urban metro system, like a very rapid and large scale transportation, but also include like local bus or even bicycling, like Professor Wang just talked about the workability and bikeability. It also be very benefit, especially for the low income. And secondly, from the uh, perspective of um, how to guarantee the safety and protect the um, the body touch or physical touch between the peoples within the very crowded uh, urban transit system. Actually, there are some means to reduce the chance to be affected. Uh, for example, in the metro systems in Beijing, currently they have the uh, uh, ventilation on the uh, very of a very high pressure. So uh, it prevents people to have a uh, have to close in a, in a very limited place. Well, on the other side, uh, the metro system do shorten the commuting time and the time is spending on public transit. That also reduce the chance to be affected. And uh, from the perspective of uh, transportation equality, we will see that increase the job accessibility is a very good mean to reduce the economy, um, the e reduce economy disadvantage for the vulnerable group, such as the low income people, or the, um, as the, uh, also include the uh, minority groups. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Professor Zhang. I, I would just like briefly to follow up on one specific aspect of transportation change in response to pandemic. Do you think that the changes are temporary and we revert to a pre-pandemic model of transport? Or do you see these as a lesson for safer, healthier transport going forward even after the pandemic? Uh, it is a very good question. I think it has a short term and long term impact. Uh, well, for the uh, on the uh, short term, people may shift from one travel mode for the uh, another, or else they can cut down the uh, uh, commuting or even uh, long distance travel. Like our uh, international students, they are currently listen for all the lectures and participate the class online. 
uh, so we have to find other creative mode to um, um, to actually um, decrease the negative impact. Uh, but on the long run, I think to some degree, we have to think about to go along well with um, COVID-19, like maybe in the long run, uh, like uh, three years or five years, the uh, period will be um, rather long that we have to open the gate and we have to have business trip and we have to have physical touch. So how to do that? Only from urban planning or only from transportation planning point of view cannot solve the problem. We have to combine them together. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Zhang, for those additional comments. Very, very informative. Uh, now I would like to turn to Professor Clarkson, if I may. Uh, Professor Clarkson, uh, one's impression from uh, your work and at least a superficial understanding is that the idea of systems thinking is a critical, almost a universal part of the approaches that you have taken across the spectrum of particular problems that you've applied uh, your activity and, uh, and intellect to solving. Um, I understand uh, particularly there is a, an initiative that you uh, have begun called Engineering Better Care. And I wonder if you could share with us some of the thinking behind that activity and what your aim is in accomplishing it, and in particular, how you see it in relation to the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. That's a very useful introduction to my passion, which is how do we take engineering thinking, the engineering mindset into other domains, into healthcare, into policy. So I had the very good fortune five years ago to be approached by the Royal Academy of Engineering to work with a team to try and understand what a systems approach to health and care improvement would look like. And I'd grown up in industry, I'd worked in technology consulting, I'd learned the hard way how to become a systems engineer. And I then spent 20 years at university thinking about the design process, trying to understand what it is people do. So we set out to talk to clinicians, care providers and improvers and patients to articulate to them what we thought the language of engineering and systems was about to understand how they responded to that and what was the common language that captured the essence of engineering systems thinking, but in an accessible form. And we looked at systems engineering, the traditional approaches, and they're too complex. They take years to master. So we ended up just very simply thinking about a systems perspective, a design perspective, a risk perspective, and a people perspective. And we ran workshops with health and care providers to try and unpack what these things meant. And what we came up with is a set of questions. What does good look like? What are the needs? How can the needs be met? How do we do things better? What could possibly go wrong? A set of natural questions that cover those four different perspectives. And we put them together as part of a process, a way of thinking which we then packaged up as a way of training, working with clinicians and care providers where the naive engineer can come in and ask these questions and train clinicians to ask these questions. And what they find is, and this comes back to Roderick's comment, that I actually think that folk on the clinical and care side find it much easier to understand engineers, but only if engineers want to make themselves understood. And we ask these simple questions and they realize suddenly they have some mastery of taking a systems approach. And we published that three years ago. And since then, we've been developing a toolkit that helps people understand more from a process perspective. Can we understand the context? Can we define the problem? Can we develop the solution? Can we collect the evidence? And most importantly, can we make the case that we're allowed to make some sort of change? And can we manage that process? how do we define the scope? So we have a way now of articulating 
this way of thinking with health and care providers. And we've been rolling this out across the UK for some time now. But increasingly with the academy, we've been talking to policymakers and folk in government, the same language, the same questions. And they're finding it transformative in their ability to start to think more holistically about the challenge in front of them. And, and therein lies the other key thing that I think is relevant to today, that we are talking about complex systems of systems. And typically we can identify the individual systems. And if we stare at them long enough, we can often figure out how they work. For me as an engineer, it's the interfaces that are much more interesting. What happens between the systems? How do they connect to each other? How do they depend on each other, communicate with each other? So before we make changes, we need to understand that system of systems and in particular, the interfaces. And that comes back to this very real challenge of how do we create resilience? And I think we need to know of resilience as a process, not just a property of a system. It's the process by which something can face a shock or a change in such a way that it can continue to perform in an acceptable manner. So we need to know the sort of changes or shocks we might predict in the future, but we need to understand how the system might respond, whether it's, where does the resilience come from? Is it robustness? Is it adaptability? Is it flexibility? Is it agility? And it's probably all of those things. And this is where I think engineering thinking has a lot to offer in this debate about how do we then create and deliver resilience for the longer term? Thank you so much. Uh, this effort, as you described it, uh, began in advance of the outbreak of uh, the COVID pandemic. Do you think uh, from your vantage point that having at least some of the leadership in key places increasingly aware of this way of thinking uh, affected in a positive way a response to the pandemic? Or is that uh, a bridge too far at this moment? How, how would you characterize that? I think at multiple levels. Uh, I know nationally in the UK, Sir Patrick and Chris Whitty, the two chief scientific advisors, both are fully aware of the systems approach we've developed and they know the language of it. And they are systems thinkers. So that's been enormously helpful. In my local hospital, where I'm, I'm a governor, I see there's real systems leadership in their governance. So where individuals have that skill to be systems leaders, you really see it in the way they excite change, the way they respond to clinical need in a pragmatic way. I think it, what it comes down to is that there are islands of excellence. We, we see systems thinkers in some places and, and often not in others. So the bigger challenge is how do we learn from the value of this way of thinking in response to the pandemic to suggest it should be part of the training for clinicians. Mm. So, so we've started training junior doctors to think in systems terms. So they can become T-shaped in the same way with that clinical core, but some maybe engineering systems on the top of the T. Well, well thank you so much. I can't help but just comment as an aside that I have a colleague who's uh, leading the university in the US who has uh, begun to talk about I-shaped education with breadth at the bottom as well as the top, a foundation of learning and understanding of the basic elements that drive society, expertise in a particular domain, and then the capacity at the top to apply and integrate that expertise with many other experts in respective domains. Uh, the images are all fascinating, but I would love to hear a little more uh, from the vantage point of education and opportunity for students today, especially in uh, engineering centers. What do you see of the lessons of this past few years impinging on the way engineering should be understood and taught to the future practitioners and leaders in the field, 
I wonder, uh, Professor Wong, if I could return to you perhaps uh, to start. And uh, then I would love to hear from a practitioner's point of view, uh, Ms. Blesserhasset, uh, your uh, perspective on the education of the engineers that you look for in your area or outside uh, as the product of the education system. But first, um, let's hear from Professor Wong. How, what implications for education do you see? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Feinberg. Um, I think um, it's really important uh, right now to uh, improve our uh, uh, course design and uh, uh, pedagogy uh, in terms of the technology uh, innovation and also the situation we are facing right now. So right now uh, we actually have different types of courses uh, like lecture courses and uh, workshop, design workshop, something like that, focusing more on the um, planning and working together as a, as a, as a team. So for lecture courses um, uh, right now, uh, especially for, for me myself, I develop a, a interesting uh, event uh, for the course. Uh, I, I host a debate for uh, each uh, semester and trying to find out a very important uh, uh, topic to, to let the students to uh, argue with each other formally. So for instance, um, right after the pandemic, uh, we are trying to figure out uh, um, if the, the uh, urbanized area will be uh, you know, more beneficial for, uh, for people's uh, health or the rural area actually right now is good uh, to, to have the better level of the public health, something like that. And we also compare small cities and large cities and uh, those uh, debates actually help the students could uh, get the sense uh, on each side and uh, to find the, the solid you know, support empirically or theoretically to, to think about these uh, controversial topics. Uh, yeah. This is one way. The other things about uh, the urban design, uh, right now we are hoping to promote more international uh, collaboration. Uh, in this way, even though you know the uh, situation right now is a little bit difficult, but we still um, are trying to get students online and uh, working on the uh, similar or same site to think about how our design skill or uh, technology in the civil engineering could uh, improve uh, what we are having right now uh, in communities and the cities. Uh, for instance, the workability, um, uh, Tongji University are collaborated with uh, IUAV University of Venice and also the Hong Kong City University. We are developing how we could design a better work uh, city uh, in high density, actually, cities to mm -hmm. promote the workability. Um, so this is sort of get the students to, to draw the vision, actually, so looking forward. So just yeah. now the lecture and the debate is more about the enlightenment and uh, um, thinking. And uh, for the design workshop, we are hoping to look forward to give vision to the future. And uh, then right now we are also uh, think um, what just uh, uh, the uh, professor uh, uh, pedigree and also uh, Dr. Uh, professor uh, Clarkson mentioned, right now the interdisciplinary education is quite important. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, our college, um, like uh, I'm trying to do is to promote the collaboration between the College of Architecture and Urban Planning with the College uh, of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're hoping we could have like a joint courses mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, teach the same course, but uh, a professor from both sides. And also, uh, hopefully, uh, in the future, we could have a sort of double, double degree yeah. or joint degree, and yeah. then students could understand both sides and uh, to really uh, create uh, something new for our work. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. D just a quick addition. Do you think there is uh, understanding and, in a way, demand from the students for this type of joint training or 
do you find that the students tend to come more narrowly focused, wanting to obtain detailed, specific skills? What, what is your experience with the students today? Well, I think um, it depends on uh, how to say that, the, the way you, you, you teach them. You, mm -hmm. You're always trying to uh, let them uh, become, um, you know, have better view of the world, have mm -hmm. broader perspective. But uh, you, you are right at the very beginning, uh, maybe especially the bachelor students, uh, they, they may focus more on uh, the skills we're trying to learn. But uh, I think uh, we, we definitely need to let them uh, think um, like uh, more innovatively. And for master students, we are hoping uh, they are not only uh, learn how to learn, but uh, they could create new knowledge. And uh, right now, um, for the students uh, in my lab, uh, master students and uh, PhD students, mm -hmm. they actually um, really like the, the, the idea of interdisciplinary. They, they are uh, well actually also working with doctors mm -hmm. and they will tell us uh, the, the mechanism of those diseases. And mm -hmm. we, then we can understand better how the urban built environment will um, influence uh, the people's health. And actually right now, the students in my lab pay more attention to their own health as well. Mm. Perhaps uh, they're taking a role model from their professor. That Thank uh, you. would be a, a good reason for it. Uh, if I may uh, come now uh, to uh, Edith Blennerhassett, as a consumer of the graduates of engineering training, what is your perspective on today? What would you see as, uh, we'll put it another way. What are today's graduates missing as they arrive to you that you wish they had had more intense background training before reaching your agency? I think our graduates are, are very diverse and they're very well informed. And I think that is a really positive thing and they want to enter the debate. And I think they're very much, uh, they want to contribute to society. And I, I think that is an important thing that, that we're not teaching our students in a vacuum, that uh, the idea of systems thinking, but uh, also that we're designing for people and that people should be at the center of what we do, that it's not about the technology, it's, it's about how you, how you deploy the technology to the benefit of, of people and planet. And um, I, th I think, you know, we're looking for them to have uh, skills in, in data and, and to follow the science, you know, to, to understand the facts and be able to analyze. And, and again, they come, they are coming with those skills and they are very eager to learn. I think we talk about key shaped people actually. So maybe that's a, a beyond, and maybe it's a mix of an I shaped and a T shaped person, but again, and it is again about the deep technical knowledge, but also maybe these understandings that has been spoken about of other other disciplines, whether it be sociology or philosophy, you know, and how, how you make how you make systems that work and how you get value. And so we like them to be curious and to question, you know, so to question a brief to say, you know, can we do this better? Can we do it differently? And and I think they do bring they bring all those qualities. They bring energy. They bring enthusiasm. They bring great ability. And and they're very good communicators. And so all of those things I think are very positive. I feel, I feel very positive for the future the, of the engineering profession. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wonder, Professor Zhang, from your experience uh, in training, would you add any additional thoughts on what? today is the best training for engineers? Okay, uh, so from my point of view, uh, I think the students are more smart uh, for current generation and it's provide more challenges and also opportunity for our faculty, how to teach them. Uh, first of all, I think the training uh, reinforce their ability to learn new knowledge and uh, the, the way to learn new knowledge are more easier and accessible in a period of uh, ICT. Uh, this is a good thing. We are more likely to learn how to do uh, the um, like online class. And this is rapidly growth uh, with, um, after the year of uh, 2020. And on the other time, I agree with uh, Professor Wang 
And uh, I think the uh, transdisciplinary education was uh, very important, especially for undergraduate students. Um, there is always a, a shift, a turn and a turn. And which is um, uh, only unchanging things is changing. So they have challenging future. We have to educate the uh, talent people for the future. Uh, in terms of future, that may be five years ago, five years later, or ten, even 10 years later. So we uh, have to prepare the um, future knowledge. That's also uh, ability for our faculty and staff. So I think, um, first of all, the um, cross-disciplinary knowledge and knowledge sharing between uh, different majors can be very helpful. And secondly, I think um, uh, due to the uh, COVID-19, one of the um, platform we can build is a platform for global um, engineers, uh, which is have the ability to participate in a global project uh, not only limited in domestic um, background or context, but also uh, have a, a couple of knowledge to know the uh, local culture and local economy issues, and they are um, um, have more uh, suitable to the uh, global project. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for those comments. I want to turn Rod to you, if I may, Professor Pettigrew. I know this uh, idea of uh, if you will, cross-disciplinary education has been a, a mainstay of your own thinking. Could you share with us how you see the future of education for engineering in relation to healthcare? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, delighted to do that, Harvey, because that is uh, what I do uh, on a daily basis now. Uh, and our approach uh, to education really involves a bit of this uh, INT model. Um, we really sleep, seek to have a blending of both engineering and medicine in the curriculum that our students pursue. They learn in an integrated fashion engineering uh, and medicine. We seek to train what I refer to as uh, scientific bilinguals, those who really understand uh, how engineering and medicine are seamlessly interwoven in human physiology and health and disease. And from this understanding of the way things are in nature, because after all, both are a part and parcel of this thing that we call life, uh, both a part and parcel of the disease processes. So to have a greater fundamental understanding of what is right and what is wrong, we have this training that is based on that. And from that greater fundamental understanding is likely to come the more effective ideas about how to problem solve. We do seek to train problem solvers, and that's not just an aspiration. We actually require it in order to accomplish the training of problem solvers. Our students uh, have the responsibility of developing a solution to a healthcare problem by graduation. And they typically pursue these, or we expect that they, they will pursue these as teams, as I've mentioned in my presentation. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the power of the team approach is quite evident in this current pandemic. Uh, the realization of the multiple vaccines uh, is, uh, is a great example of that. And if we are to be successful and optimally prepared in the future, we need to have students who really have a fundamental understanding of nature of how engineering and medicine are interwoven in nature. And that is going to lead us to uh, being able to achieve some of these goals that we have, such as developing pan vaccines, uh, such as developing um, techniques and technologies 
that are adaptable and applicable to a variety of infectious agents, to a variety of, of viruses, even before the pandemic strikes. So that's, you know, our approach to education. I do want to make a, a related comment regarding the, the concept of macro to, to, to micro, which was nicely uh, uh, presented by, uh, by Edith. But I would add an additional level to that. You know, the engineers are involved in the macro, we're involved in the micro, and also in the nano. The nano engineering, this uh, field that's emerging or has emerged, immunoengineering is upon us. Uh, immunoengineering has, you know, great uh, potential to help us to modulate the immune system in ways that uh, stimulate it, in ways that inhibit it when we need to inhibit it, in ways to accentuate it when we need to accentuate it. Uh, immunoengineering through nanotechnology uh, has a great promise uh, and is currently at play now. And the final comment, Ar Harvey, <laughs> is that because of all of this, I think that going forward and being prepared for a future pandemic, we need to not only think of a medical team of being con consistent of doctors and nurses and healthcare technicians, but also engineers. Engineers need to be a part of that team uh, in planning and getting prepared for a pandemic. Engineers should be a part of the planning process. There should be bi-directional conversations between the frontline clinicians, uh, the basic scientists, and the engineers so as to be best pre prepared and actually bring into reality this concept of a holistic and systems approach to problem solving. Well, thank you so very much for those uh, reflections and uh, responses. Uh, I would uh, love now, if I may, to invite uh, Professor Clarkson for uh, his reflections, uh, particularly on this question of preparing the next generation, but any other general comment you might wish to add uh, as we uh, reach the conclusion of our uh, session. I would have to agree with many comments already made, but probably suggest we need pie-shaped people just to take the discussion further with <laughs> a technical discipline, that breadth, but probably communication skills to pick up on some of the comments. I, I do think we need to teach people how to learn, how to be curious. We need to teach them how to be problem solvers. I think probably on top of that, and probably more importantly, we have to teach them to be problem seekers, that they understand how to find the right problem to solve. And that's what a systems approach is very much about. I think we want our engineers of the future to move away from being those who can answer the textbook question, the answers at the back. They can answer the design challenge where the problem's been stated. But I think we need to teach our future systems leaders, engineers, clinicians to be comfortable in the fog. They need to be comfortable in the messy real world of multi, multiple interconnected systems where they cannot quite see what's going on. All they can do is ask questions and talk to people. And at some point, the fog will clear and they'll begin to see what it is that the real challenge is about. And those around them will have that same perspective. They'll see the same things. They'll be talking the same language. And they'll set off to solve the right problem with all those problem solving skills and technical skills that we have taught them over the years. And for me, the revelation of the last few years has been that half of my research team are now clinicians. And that's transformative in the way the engineers and the clinicians come together over coffee, over challenges, over problems. We learn about each other's ways of thinking and ways of doing. So we, I don't need to be an anaesthetist, but I at least now know part of the language of what happens in theater. So I think there's many ways we can make people into those pie shaped or even stool shaped people, three legged people, who knows? But the key for me is problem seeking. Let's solve the right problems going forward. So there's no surprises in the engineered future. Perfect. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Clarkson. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to uh, uh, turn our attention to video remarks. Unfortunately, our time has uh, is, uh, come to a point where we uh, have to now uh, hear from, uh, from Ming Xia, uh, who is uh, the CEO of Fulgen Genetics uh, for his uh, recorded remarks to our seminar. Uh, so let's take a, a, a few minutes to hear uh, from me. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Fulgen Genetic is very pleased to be part of today's seminar, which has been organized in conjunction with the National Academy of Engineering, the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and the UK Royal Academy of Engineering. I had very much enjoyed our virtual chat back in April early this year, and hope that we'll be able to meet in person sometime soon. As a member of the National Academy of Engineering, I am very pleased to support the Tri Academy's effort as we all participate and contribute in the global effort to combat COVID-19. I am very grateful to all the speakers and the discussants who shared their expertise over the past months. The story they told only scratch the surface of the complement produced by the engineers to deal with the, a global crisis. It has been especially critical during this pandemic that scientists, medical professions, and engineers around the world have worked together to share the data research information, and the resources in a collaborative manner to evoke a unified response for testing and treatment of the virus. Fulgen Genetics has been on the forefront of the battle against COVID-19, taking early steps to launch testing solutions, which today are being leveraged by the various organizations across the United States, including school systems, clinics, hospitals, municipalities, government agencies, and the private companies. Early in the pandemic, forging Genetic recognized a need to pivot our resources from our commercial genetic testing business to focus our efforts on widespread RT-PCR testing for COVID-19 with a focus on rapid turnaround time and superior testing quality and accuracy. Testing has played a critical role in the road to recover from this pandemic, and will continue to be essential as we conduct research on the virus and the variants to protect ourselves from both COVID-19 and all from the potential breakouts of the other deadly virus in future. In fact, Fulgen Genetics is one of the top organizations currently working with the CDC closely, leveraging our NGS capabilities for genetic sequencing to aid ongoing research to track new COVID-19 variants, as well as tracking spread and the mutation of the virus. I applaud the effort of the individuals today that truly made a difference by their early action in response to the pandemic for the benefit of the greater good. 
their actions demonstrate how advancement in engineering in collaboration with scientific research can drive positive change for our society. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. We look forward to the day when we'll be able to celebrate in person together. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ming, for your wonderful remarks, your inspiring vision, and for your core support that has enabled this series to take place. We've heard of the critical role of engineering as an analytic discipline, as a synthetic discipline, as a way of conceptualizing problems and a way of solving problems, as a distinct discipline and as a bridge builder across disciplines, as having a capacity to tolerate ambiguity, work in the fog, as we have heard, and with the ability to discern, discriminate, detect, and analyze the key components that make up solutions. We've had some wonderful examples today from each of our uh, national representatives, the various individuals who have shared their perspectives on solutions to the COVID pandemic uh, from engineering and much more than simply uh, COVID, not that it is simple. We've talked about the lessons of engineering for COVID and the implications of COVID for the future of engineering, including for education. More than anything, I would like to add that the very fact of this international collaboration across the three academies of engineering M is an emblem of the kind of global collaboration that will continue to be an essential component of successfully coping with truly global challenges, including the COVID pandemic. I'd like finally to express on behalf of all of us who've had the privilege of hearing today, our sincere thanks to our presenters and panel participants, to Edith Blennerhassett, to Rod Pettigrew, to Lan Wong, to John Clarkson, Amy Pickering, and Chun Zhang. Eminent, sharing, and caring individuals who have enlightened us today. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you all who are attending. And thank you again, Ming, for your continued strong support of this effort. We'll now conclude.